Welcome everybody to the Red Bud program for this evening with the flora of Nevada and Placer counties with Shane Hamphy. We appreciate that all of you are on time and ready to go. We're just going to leave a few minutes before we start up just to give people who are still, you know, doing the, the figuring out Zoom thing, I give them a couple minutes to come online and then we'll get started. Thanks so much. Once again, welcome to this evening's Red Bud chapter of the California Native Plant Society and our special program with Shane Hansey, whom you see there at the top of your screen, and the flora of Nevada and Placer counties. Shane has a special relationship with this, which we're going to hear about in just a little while. I thought to give, and I'm Chrissy Freeman, I'm the publicity chair for Red Bud. Unfortunately, our our president is not able to be here this evening. Had an, uh, Leslie Warren had another commitment, and so we miss her. And uh, we see a number of other Red Bud folks who are already here. So that's great. I'm going to start by doing a few announcements. The very first of which is that yes, for all who wanted to know, we are having a spring plant sale. We will hold it online on Sunday, April 28th, on our online Redbud store and from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. it'll be for CNPS members only and we will and from 1 to 5 it will be for the general public. If you do not have so you know, those will be spring plants and riparian plants so those will be plants that can take water um, even in the warmer months of the year, or ones that look like sticks in the fall, so it's better to sell them in the spring. Okay, so we wanted to tell you about a couple of, uh, several events that Redbud's going to be tabling out in the next little while. So you can come to one of these events, chat with us about native plants, you can ask questions, you can buy our books, which are the wildflowers of Nevada and Placer County, and the trees of Nevada and Placer Counties. So the upcoming tabling events are April 6th, which is Spring Fest at the South Yuba River State Park at Bridgeport. It is a glorious place in the spring if you have never been. I'm sure it'll be very busy, so arrive early for reasonable parking. April 13th, the Placer County Master Gardeners are having a garden fair at the Maidu Community Center in Roseville. April 20th, the Bear Yuba Land Trust Nature Fest will happen at Wildflower Ridge in Grass Valley. It's just uphill outside of town, maybe five minutes from town, very convenient. And a lovely new property that they have acquired and open to the public. April 20th and 21st is the Union Home and Garden Show. The Union is, for those who don't know, the local paper in Nevada County. And that's at the Nevada County Fairgrounds, which is really one of the nicest fairgrounds you'll ever see. And finally, April 21st, which is Earth Day, it, we will be tabling in downtown Nevada City. So welcome to all. 
here's what I want to let's see. Um, doo -doo -doo. I'm just gonna check. Let's see what we got here. I'm just looking at chat. Okay, terrific. Let's look at the new message. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, if you hear an echo, would you check and see if that happens to be your own system? Because uh, most people are not hearing an echo. But we're hoping that is resolved for whoever, for the person who did have an issue. That's great. Okay. So before we get started, I wanted to say that we it have that we you will not be able to we will not be able to see you and we will not be able to hear you but you can as some people already have use the chat feature in zoom to ask any questions that you may have uh of shane or any comments if you have any tech questions or comments on how the tech is going in this so uh you should see chat uh i see it in the bottom of my Zoom screen, you might see it on the top of your Zoom screen. So just put it in there. Okay, terrific. So now, any other housekeeping? Okay. Uh, any? We do not have, so someone asked if there's any Redbud field trips this year. There will be. We have a new Redbud field trip chair and, and we have an, uh, identified a number of volunteers who are interested in helping make field trips happen. So we are really feeling great about what our field trip potential is going to be for this year. Stay tuned. And also, if you have any interest in uh, suggesting a place for a field trip, place you know, uh, or you'd like to help organize a field trip, but you're not the botanist for the field trip, that's fine. Just let us know. The more people participate, the more we can have field trips. Okay. So now, on our program. So... This is going to be The Flora of Nevada and Placer Counties by Shane Hannafy. So Shane is an, um, oh yes, I have to start the, the Zoom recording too. Pardon me. Okay, oh, it's already started. Thank you. Okay, so um, Shane Hannafy is a self-taught certified field botanist. Well, let me say that's quite the accomplishment, okay? He became enamored with native plants shortly after he moved to California from New York over, over 10 years ago. And we all know that California is so inspirational in terms of native plants. Shane caught that when he arrived. Okay, since then, he's traveled throughout California, exploring and documenting California's fascinating flora. He goes out as a field botanist throughout the growing seasons and the blooming seasons for plants all over California. That is what he has earned as a certified field botanist. Good for him. In that time, Shane's developed a keen understanding of the floristics of the Northern Sierra in particular. At the same time, he's cultivated a love for plant taxonomy and science communication. He is a fabulous writer. We know this. He is the former president of our Red Bud chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And he lives in Grass Valley with his wife, Ashley, and their bouncing baby boy, Milo. And so with that, we'll start our program. And if you have any questions or any comments, ah, yes, Ray Lynn points out that Shane and she, Ray Lynn Noel, who is fabulous, uh, is uh, she and Shane will do a wildfire trip for the Berryuba Land Trust on May 4th. Shane now is part of the Berryuba Land Trust staff. So congratulations to him at Berryuba Land Trust and all of us. Okay, take it away, Shane. Okay, well, thank you so much for that warm welcome. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Shane Hanafi, and I'm a guy who's nearly done writing a flora for Nevada County, not Placer County, uh, at least not yet. Um, so yeah, this is going to be about the floor of Nevada County. Um, I'm here to introduce you uh, to this beautiful place. I want to remind those who are familiar uh, with the county of the special place that we get to enjoy and hopefully infect all of you with a bit of my enthusiasm for the plant life to be found here. Uh, I don't want to dawdle too much on introductions when we have so much to see, so let's just get into it. 
Uh, Nevada County is a small county. It's about 974 square miles, and we're situated more or less at the nexus of the North and Central Sierras. We're bordered by Placer County to the south, Yuba County to the north and west, and then Sierra County is north of the eastern portion. Uh, the Middle Fork of the Yuba River forms the northern border, and the Bear River is the southern border, and then near their headwaters, the county border shoots off straight east to the state of Nevada, which encompasses a good chunk of the Truckee River as it spills out towards Reno. Uh, the result is a chunk of land that's shaped much like an old revolver, and the gun barrel here of the revolver is only nine miles north to south. Um, and the western half, this wider part over here, is only a little bit more than double that. So this is the unceded territory of the Nisenan and Washoe peoples, who are very much still here. And it is their caretaking, which formed and shaped the flora I'm going to be introducing you all to. This was one of the first places scoured by the gold rush, and its scars are visible even in this satellite imagery here. Uh, here's the North Columbia diggings and Malakov diggings. We have the Alpha and Omega diggings over here and the Red Dog and Ubet diggings, all visible. Uh, all these sites were hydraulically mined and were irreversibly changed because of it. Uh, we have a really unique flora in many ways, where the southern extent for many species which come down from the Cascades or the Klamaths, where the northern extent for many taxa found commonly in the southern Sierra, we get many coastal plants reach their eastern extent, and many Great Basin taxa reach their western terminus here too. So it's a bit of a botanical mixing pot. Our lowest spot is along the western county border near Camp Far West. It's 285 feet. And our highest point is Mount Lola at 9,143 feet. It's this elevational gradient, which has the largest impact on the vegetation communities and leads to the county being very diverse, especially for its size. So it's pretty customary to talk geology when you're talking about a flora, but there's honestly little to note regarding the geology here. Uh, we have mostly volcanic and metavolcanic rocks across the entire county. Um, this is owing to the volcanic legacy of the Sierras. There's very little sedimentary rocks, no limestone, gypsum, or sandstone. Um, but we do have banned other substrates known to have an outmoded impact on the plant life, uh, such as gabbro, serpentine, and we have scattered lava caps. Uh, all of these are in the western part of the county. Uh, the extents of granite outcrops found on the high elevations play a big part in influencing the flora. Whether that granite is intact or decomposed, there's a suite of plants which seem to have an affinity for growing there and only there. Our soils tend to be acidic, with only one obvious alkaline habitat in the entire county that I know of anyway, and that's a single seep near the eastern border. Okay, fire. Uh, Nevada County has really been spared from major fires like those, those we've seen both north and south of us. Um, but our lack of fire history is kind of historic um, in the sense that we've had zero catastrophic fires since colonizers first arrived. And this is largely owing, owing to stalwart fire suppression attitudes, but also to the, the fact that we have a Cal Fire Air Base in Grass Valley, which means that fires that do break out are quickly put out before they grow out of control. So both sides of the crest are comprised mostly of fire adapted plant communities. Um, this points to pre-colonial fires being much more frequent than in post-colonial times. Um, and the only exception to this is the extensive granite band found mostly above 5,000 feet and extending just over the Sierra Crest. And that's because it, the vegetation is generally sparse there. Uh, it exists only really in isolated islands. And there the fire season is short and there's just not much fuel for it. Uh, most of the granites are very remote, so they don't have a human caused fires pose much of a threat. But in the fire adapted parts of the county, however, there is now extensive overgrowth and super dense woodlands posing the ever present threat of catastrophic fire, which is just now beginning to be addressed with thinning projects across the county, for better or for worse. Um, okay, so here are some of the notable plant communities I wanted to highlight for their unique floras within the county. Uh, each has a suite of taxa which are found only in these environments, but many taxa are found in several. Uh, I'm going to quickly mention each one, but I won't be spending much time on any. Okay, from our lowest elevations to around 1,500 feet, blue oak woodlands are abundant. They do occur higher up as well, we're but they're far more scattered yeah. there. There we go. Yeah, now oh. we see it. Yeah, there is a... And I already moved on to the next one. Second. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we, there's we, a delay. We see apparently. blue oak woodland change, sorry. Yeah. That's good to know. Okay, so... Uh, 
hopefully now you're seeing the vernal pools. Uh, we, we do have many vernal pools in the county, uh, but they're not even as abundant as those found in the lower elevations. Um, they appear in the lowlands, in the mountains themselves, and perhaps most abundantly east of the crest. At each elevation, the species in the different ver uh, vernal pools, um, are they change drastically. So each one has a character all its own. Okay, so then between 2,000 and 3,000 feet, we have a narrow band of gabbro covering about 18 miles, uh, and that cuts directly through Grass Valley. This is dominated by chaparral and holds the greatest number of rare taxa of any habitat in the county. It's also one of the fastest disappearing habitats as it's frequently targeted for development and massive mastication efforts. There was once a solid expanse of gabbro from Empire Mine all the way across town to where the Briar Patch now, skits, uh, now sits. But the Grass Valley gabbros are almost entirely gone now. They exist in small pockets between developments across the city. The Idaho Maryland Mine threatened one remaining bit and that's safe for now, but the Dorsey Marketplace will remove another. Uh, okay, there's also chaparral found on soils other than gabbro at low to mid elevations in the county. There you'll find some of the same species as are found on gabbro, but many others grow here which can't tolerate the ultramafics. Uh, also quite abundant from the lowest elevations and reaching about 2,500 feet are the live oak forests. These are quite dense compared to the blue oak woodlands and have a tendency to grow on steeper terrain than the blue oaks. Above that, uh, between about 2,000 to 4,000 feet is the lower conifer belt. On, at the lower side, it's primarily mixed conifer forest, but higher elevations lose most of the deciduous trees from the canopies and become overwhelmingly conifer dominant. So throughout the western county are scattered pockets of serpentine, uh, but there are extensive bands around the 4,000 foot level west of the crest. Um, this is our little slice of a band of serpentine which runs quite far along the Sierra and contains many unique and rare taxa. Our extensive river canyons must be highlighted for their unique denizens. Higher elevation plants travel down the canyons farther west than they normally appear, and the same happens in reverse with lower elevation plants. On top of that, the canyons hold a selection of plants which seem to only enjoy their rocky slopes. The shady, damp, north-facing sides of these primarily east-west canyons are drastically different from the parched, sun-baked, south-facing sides. The plants I refer to here are not found at the water's edge, but higher upslope, um, but they do seem to be affected by higher levels of humidity than the ridges and flats elsewhere. Okay, the diggins, um, which I mentioned uh, earlier. Let me take another bit, take another okay. pause. There it goes. The delay is much longer than I anticipated. Okay. Um, okay. Our diggings here, these are human created landscapes and uh, they're not anywhere close to recovering from the mining days, but they also present unique habitats. Um, there are many wetlands in them and believe it or not, a surprising number of rare and unique taxa to be found here. Okay. Next is the lava caps. Um, these are scattered uh, between 2,500 feet and 5,000 feet. One of the more uh, the soils are often very acidic, with a high diversity of plants in the blueberry family, or Acacii, as a result. There are numerous fens and bogs to be found here, with some pretty special plants in, the, in them. Okay, expansive granite, our expansive granite outcrops begin at 5,000 feet west of the crest and continue up and over to the other side. They cradle many lakes and small islands of forest but the open rocks and the benches that are filled with decomposed granite from those outcrops, they have a, a flora all of their own. Okay, typically found above 6,000 feet, the fir forests occupy the highest elevations of closed canopy sites in the region. They're typified by the dominance of red fir, but in some places, white fir can be just as prevalent. And then throughout the high elevations, there are expansive montane meadows, which display these beautiful tapestries of colorful blooms in the southern months. Um, definitely worth going out into the mountains just to go see some of the meadow blooms. Okay, subalpine habitats. These contain the last trees before they give way to the highest reaches in the county. Many, uh, many of these trees display Krumholtz forms, um, which is where they're sort of deformed from the snowpack and winds. And these vast tracts of Wyethia mollus that you're seeing here, the woolly mule's ears, they're very, it's a very common sight in that, that area. Uh, at the tips of a few of our peaks, alpine plants can be found. We don't have a ton of alpine habitat, um, but what we have is pretty darn amazing. Uh, most of the plants there are hardy perennials, and several are quite rare.
Also throughout the higher reaches are swaths of mountain chaparral. So interestingly, many genera which appear in the lower elevation chaparral also appear in the montane chaparral, but the species are different. Then on the east side of the crest, the elevation drops off quickly, and the Truckee and Sage Hen basins are mostly dominated by pine forests. Like the conifer forest west of the crest, uh, there are many fens and bogs found here too, and different but equally amazing plants in those fens and bogs. Okay, scattered at first, but then becoming more numerous and dominant are the east side scrublands. Um, this is a peek into how we are nearing or possibly already within the Great Basin Floristic Region. And speaking of the Great Basin Floristic Region, at the easternmost end of the county, we have a five mile wide band of de definitively Great Basin habitat. Uh, many plants of the county flora can be found in this small slice and nowhere else. It's drastically underdocumented and frankly very difficult to, uh, to access. And certainly many more plants new to the county and maybe even the state will be found here. Okay, those are our habitats. Um, so next, I wanna talk a bit about the botanical history of Nevada County. And so our earliest collections were made by those botanists who were working to route the Transcontinental Railroad across the Sierras. And it was John Bigelow in 1853 who made the first collection we have on record. Now the earliest imaged voucher I could find is here on the left. Um, this is the isotype for Areogonum umbilatum torianum, and it was collected in 1865 by John Torrey. In the early days, small amounts of collections were made by notable botanists such as Lemon, Green, Bolander, and Kellogg. But the three early botanists profiled here briefly uh, made outstanding contributions to the Nevada County flora. Beside each name are the dates uh, which couch their life actively collected in Nevada County, and then in parentheses, the number of collections that each made. So starting on the left side, Charles Son, or Sani, I'm actually not sure how to pronounce his last name, um, was one of our earliest collectors. And he was a bookkeeper who worked for the Truckee Lumber Company, and he collected extensively in the Truckee River watershed, but rarely anywhere else. And then uh, Amos Heller, who I could not find any photos of him living. Um, this is actually his gravestone. He's buried in Chico, just north of Nevada County. Um, he taught botany at the University of Minnesota and at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. He extensively collected the Western U.S. at large. And he also founded an early botanical journey called Mullenbergia. And then on the right, Marcus Jones was another extensive collector in the Western U.S. around the turn of the century. He founded the journal Contributions to Western Botany, and he described over 165 species of plants in his long career, which is uh, quite a number. I guess it was a little easier in the earlier days. Okay, the Middle Ages of Nevada County Botany were characterized by the work of a trio of California Academy of Sciences associated collectors. On the left, John Thomas Howell was one of these, and he was ex an extremely important figure in California botany statewide. Like his impact on our botanical understanding can't be overstated. Um, I, I recommend, you know, he has, he's got a Wikipedia page for, <laughs> that's that's saying something for, for a botanist in California. Uh, in the center, again, couldn't find a picture, um, but this is one of the, um, I think one of the more beautiful collections made by Barbara Trowbridge. She was a curatorial assistant at uh, the California Academy of Sciences in the 70s. Um, they're an absolute pleasure to view. And I've learned quite a bit of technique, um, mounting technique, from viewing his sheets. Okay, let's talk about my project now. Um, it all started with True's checklist, Gordon True's checklist. In 2019, I was gifted his primary notebooks by Bill Wilson, who is a founding member of the Red Bud chapter of CNPS. Um, and I've since digitized these to preserve them in perpetuity. Hopefully, um, those are we can make those available uh, somewhere soon for everyone. Um, but I was really inspired after reading them. The next step was taking True's checklist and updating the taxonomy. Now, mind you, True was working in the 60s and 70s, so this was before the Jepson manual. Um, he was probably using a resource called um, that was written by Munns, um, and a lot, a, like a lot, has changed since then. A, a huge amount of names has changed. 
Um, so I had to cross check everything and make sure it had the updated taxonomy and make sure that um, the plants that were on True's list were uh, were still thought to be here or or that you know that they weren't plants that are now considered to be elsewhere or obsolete at this point. Uh, and then I needed to investigate all of his odd inclusions, starting with comparison against my own checklists. Unfortunately, while he gave location information in his checklist, vouchers were not cited. And so many could not be relocated and verified, even after extensive searching in the field. So True extensively collected the county, county and he doubtlessly referred to vouchers to expand his checklist, but not all of the plants he claimed to exist here have an existing voucher to back them up. I would not be surprised if there were vouchers for each and every plant he listed, and they've just been lost uh, lost to time in the past 50 years, or, or for whatever reason are missing from our modern databases. Um, so anyway, I next queried the online databases, which are called uh, CCH1 and 2, it's the Consortium of California Herbarium, is what CCH stands for, as well as uh, SignNet, which is um, a consortium of uh, East, uh, I think East Coast, uh, elsewhere in the US anyway, or Barry elsewhere in the US. And so this was in order to become aware of as many vouchers as I could possibly track down. There are just a bit more than 30,000 collections in Nevada County on the CCHs and another 5,000 on CNET. But most of these are highly concentrated along the I-80 corridor and large chunks of the county have few or no collections. A good amount of these 35,000 collections are imaged uh, really good. Um, with most taxa, it's extremely useful for confirming the plants easily. Um, this doesn't work for plants which need detail examination, your grasses, your sedges, and things that you need microscopes and tiny details for. Um, but it does lessen the workload significant to be able to quickly confirm vouchers from home. Uh, next, I did search through the Calflora user submitted observations, but ultimately that yielded little um, however, those that were added through Calcor were certainly just as important as all the rest. And lastly, I need to sing some praises because iNaturalist has been an absolute treasure trove to, for this project. Many new species were located via that site. And most users are very friendly and helpful and communicative. And some even granted me permission to visit their properties and collect the cool plants that they posted. So the uploads there really gave me the ability to fill gaps in the collection record in a targeted manner. I didn't have to explore as much as I ordinarily would have without iNaturalist. Okay, the next step was getting off of my computer and going out to visit some herbaria. So uh, the abbreviated herbaria listed above, I visited in person and thumbed through their shelves. Um, these ones contain the vast amount of taxa that I ended up including, including in the flora. And the others below, with relatively few collections I needed to see, most of those involved emailing back and forth with the curators that run the herbarium, being sent pictures, sometimes taken with the curator's cell phones. Um, you know, so along the way, I had to correct many, many errors that exist in these herbaria data sets. Uh, of course, more collections are always needed, and that is, you know, that is the message that's put out there. More people should be collecting plants and depositing them in their herbarium. Um, but there is an extreme deficit of review of these collections. Now, mind you, this is not a criticism. There's only so much time and only so many skilled reviewers, but it is a problem which limits the usefulness of conclusions that can be drawn from this data in bulk. Okay, so here's a map. Hopefully it's switched over so you can see it. This is a map of my own collections since 2020. When I was empowered to begin collecting, I was finally convinced that it was an activity that I not only could, but should partake in. And it happened right before I began this flora project. But much more extensive are my iNaturalist observations. So most of these are detailed entries with emphasis on diagnostic features and even microscopy when it's appropriate. It's essentially a digitized photographic record of nearly every plant I've ever seen. And I return to these often for various reasons. So the next step, I needed to do lots of field work. I had to visit those sites that had few collections, those special habitats, those undocumented occurrences. You can go with friends, you can go alone, but you need to go often. And then you need to follow that up with more field work. And then you have to do more field work 
it really doesn't end. And luckily, that's the best part of this job, getting out in the woods. Okay, so once I got groups to an acceptable level of confidence that I had completed their review, I started writing localized keys and eventually got through every family and genus found in the county. Localized keys are extremely beneficial to enamoring locals to the plants of an area. So let's be real for a second. The Jepson manual is intimidating. Many people don't like books that heavy. There's lots of abbreviations and vernacular to learn and absorb, but a local key when done well is succinct and can take, can take advantage of local characters, which may not hold true at the state level. Now I'm not saying that my keys forego vernacular and are easy to use, Plants are complicated and there's no getting around that in some cases, but here's a good example of how things can be made leagues easier. Arctostaphylus, the manzanitas, are a highly diverse genus in California. There's 107 taxa or something like that. So a local key works to trim locally irrelevant key breaks and turns 12 pages of keys in the Jepson manual into this, because we do only have six taxa here. It's so much easier this way. So as I said, the flora is in progress, but it's getting closer and closer to having a first draft done. I have released a draft field edition and we are getting an earthquake. Just gonna let that rumble by. I wonder if you all are feeling that. <laughs> okay, that was I'll interesting. Say I'm feeling it too, yes. And I'm hearing <laughs> it, you know, in the walls. Okay, thank you. A snowstorm and an earthquake, just in time for my talk. All right. Enough natural disasters, let's move on. Um, so yeah, I've, I've released a, a draft first uh, field edition, which is what I'm calling that trimmed edition with only a list of plants and identification keys that people can keep on their phones and easily bring into the field. I want the readers and the locals and the visitors who are coming here to look at plants to test my keys and offer feedback to find and correct errors, because believe me, there are errors. I am not perfect by any means. Um, if I can make things even a little bit more clear through the feedback a user offers me, I consider, consider that a great success. Uh, actually, at the end of this talk, I'm going to be dropping a link into the chat with the latest edition of the field edition. So please save it on your computer and your phones. Try it out for me this season. And please get in touch if you have any feedback. I would really, really appreciate that. OK, moving on to demographics. Um, I can only give approximate numbers at this point because, you know, it's currently incomplete. But there's a, approximately 2,000 taxa in the entirety of the county, uh, of which about 1,600 are native. And we have about 80 to 85 rare plants. And there's a range there because there are some rare plants that I've yet to uh, confirm. And unfortunately, they're rare. So it's very hard to get out and just go find them. Uh, they might exist in just one small population. And the location might be kept secret. And in any case, I'm, I'm working on it. OK, here are the most diverse families. Um, they're the expected families, probably. You have the asters, the grasses, etc. And then below that are the most diverse genera. The sedges lead the pack by far. And those are followed by the rushes, clovers, buckwheats, lupins, buttercups, and violets. So many taxonomic issues have popped up while compiling this flora. Many I can't really opine on, and I really only want to lay out the problematic groups as I've researched them. So hopefully by listing them, it will entice uh, some researchers to address them. The first step to solving a problem is admitting you have a problem, and we have many problems. Um, each one of these bullets, which is a selected list to be sure, there are more, uh, could spur a lengthy rant on, my, rant on my part. So I'll move on quickly. But if anyone is looking for a thesis or a research project and wants to work on any of these, please uh, get in contact. I'd be happy to explain them a bit more. One of the interesting patterns I've uncovered is a distributional phenomena that I've dubbed the redbud gap, which I named for the CMPS chapter, which covers the region these plants skip over, the chapter I'm currently speaking to. It's you guys. I named it for you. Uh, I counted nearly 70 taxa, which appear both above and below Nevada and Placer counties in the Sierra, but are absent within them. There's nothing immediately apparent to explain this. There's no weather pattern, geology, nothing I could find. I have no theories at this time for why this appears so often. Um, but if you have any theories, let's uh, test them out. 
Okay, moving on to talk about some of the interesting plants that can be found in Nevada County. And we're going to start here with Lycopodiella inundata, the inundated club moss. This rare lycophyte, meaning it's a it's a ally, it's a fern ally. Um, even though it's called a club moss, it's a moss, it's a fern or a fern ally. <laughs> Um, so this grows beside streams in one of our diggins uh, and nowhere else in the county. So elsewhere in California, it grows in a bog in Humboldt County. That's this dot all the way on the top left there. And then last year, or maybe it was the year before, it was actually discovered in Sierra County, oddly also in a diggins. Um, I have no idea why it keeps popping up in diggins, but it is a fascinating little plant and a fascinating distribution pattern. So next is Viola cuneata. This is the wedge leaf violet. You can see it's not uncommon in the Klamaths and the North Coast, as evidenced by all those blue dots in the uh, northwest corner of the state. But then there's our little blue dot in Nevada County. Um, it grows here in one population uh, near the town of Washington and the serpentines out there. We also have the southernmost confirmed population of Darlingtonia californica. That's the pitcher plant. Um, that dot on the shore of Lake Tahoe uh, that you can see there is almost certainly an error. I, I think we know if Darlingtonia grew right on the edge of Lake Tahoe. Um, but we do have a couple populations in Nevada County. Interestingly, despite their affinity for serpentine in the Klamaths, they don't seem to have the same affinity in the Sierra. Next is Calisthesia stebensia, it's Stebbins morning glory. This is a federally protected plant which grows exclusively on gabbro and sports those real odd leaves with the finger-like lobes in the center picture there. It's very unlike other morning glories. Our populations are the northernmost in its range. So we are lucky to be one of the three California counties with the population of Juncus digitatus. The fruits are unique in the genus. Um, they almost look like a little pea pod, little legume pod. Um, this one grows in one place in the county in a seasonally wet drainage on top of serpentine. If you notice, when you're talking about unique plants, you talk about serpentine quite a bit. Um, okay, next plant is Sedalcia stipularis, the Scadden flat checker bloom. Um, this is our only county endemic, believe it or not. We're just too small to have more. Um, an endemic, by the way, if you're not familiar with that term, means it grows in an area and nowhere else. So a county endemic would mean it grows in Nevada County and no other county. Um, so Sedalcia stipularis is extremely rare. Um, there's only a couple hundred individuals left. And it's thought to be the most basal extant species of Sedalcia, which basically means it's the quote unquote most primitive of all of the checker blooms. Um, unfortunately, its days do seem numbered. Um, it seems to have lost the ability to reproduce via seed, and so it only propagates via its rhizomes. Uh, it's on private property, and it's not able to be visited by the general public, but the landowner is very protective of it, so that's good at least. So the next several slides, um, these detail interesting finds made by yours truly during the production of this flora, beginning with this odd coastal disjunct in sedum radiatum, as the map shows, it's not unheard of in the Sierra, in the central and southern Sierra there. But this was the first find in the northern Sierra. So my dot really stands out there, doesn't it? And here's one that's very common along the in immediate coast. Um, this is Struthiopterus spicant, the deer, deer fern. And I found it a few years back entirely by accident along a remote creek that was not easy to descend into and was even harder to get back out of. Uh, it's been known from El Dorado County for some time, but this find marks the first population outside that county for the Sierra. And it is a large, healthy population. Okay, this one is Streptanthus tortuosus truei, or True's jewel flower, named for Gordon True, who made the first collection of it. Um, this was only known from a quarter mile stretch of the middle fork of the Yuba River, which forms the northern border of Nevada County with Sierra County on the other side. But myself, along with my friends Hannah Kang and Thea Chesney, found it a hop, skip, and jump away just on the other side of the canyon, but technically in Sierra County. 
So I later made up for ending its endemic status in, in Nevada County by locating the second ever population of this very rare plant, a whopping eight miles away in the South Yuba River Canyon. Now that may not seem like a very far, a very large range extension, but again, technically I did increase its range by a factor of 32, which is not insignificant, I'd say. Okay, next is Erythranthe geniculata, the bent stem monkey flower, or maybe it's not. But after talking to monkey flower expert Naomi Fraga, we're calling it Erythranthe geniculata for now. This grows in a very specific habitat. It grows only in the cracks of sheer rock faces near the lowest elevations in the county, but only those facing south. Uh, strangely, it doesn't grow at the base of these cliffs, just at mid-face. And no seed which drop, drops to the ground seems to germinate. And it seems like the petioles, so that's the little stalk that holds the, um, the fruit, turn themselves around and plant the seeds behind them in the rock, which is a behavior that other plants found exclusively on rock faces do display, but it's not something that Erythranthe geniculata has been known to do. I've not confirmed this behavior beyond a reasonable doubt, so more work is needed. And maybe when it's all said and done, this might be something different than the geniculata common in the Southern Sierra. But I've gotten quite good at finding it. See all those dots in NorCal? All of those are my observations, ex except for the one at the Sutter Buttes. And I just got word that a few weeks ago it was found near Whiskeytown in Shasta County, too. Um, here's another disjunct in Kekiela corombosa, the redwood bush penstemon. Um, this one took me three years to time the flowering correctly and visit the extremely difficult to access place that it grows in the dead heat of summer when it blooms. It was extremely exciting to see its gorgeous red flowers, and it confirmed the hunch I had for its identity when I'd seen it only vegetative during all of those ill-timed visits prior. Um, here's the somewhat newly described uh, Carex certistachia, the arching sedge. Um, I collected this in Nevada County last year. My friend Daniel Nicholson got in contact with me because he wanted to show me a strange sedge he found in a small shady meadow at around 3,000 feet or so on the ridge. Uh, I also didn't recognize it at the time, but I collected some to key at home. Come to find out, um, this worked to close the former redbud gap between populations of this species in Butte and Yuba counties and in El Dorado County. I told Lawrence Janeway about my find. He and Peter Zika described this species, and his response to me was, huh, I wondered when it'd be found in Nevada County. Just doing my part. Here's Facelia purpusei, um, which I would have maybe included in the redbud gap slide as well, except that I found it in 2022, smack dab in the middle of the gap in its range. It seems to be gabbro in our area, but it was only found because of a fire. If uh, y'all are local and remember we had a fire that burned the um, East Bennett gabbros over there, uh, I found this plant the year after in that area. Um, that fire um, had burned a stand of the weird Nevada Yuba County Fremonted Dendron, and myself and some other folks were investigating if the fire had caused germination of the Fremonted Dendron seed bank. The answer to that question is, boy, did it ever. Um, but the fire also caused the germination of a decent-sized population of this facilia here. I'd later find a second population, also in a burn area on Gabbro. I often wonder... Um, are there more species present here only as seeds prevented from showing themselves by our zealous fire suppression tactics? Next is the new confirmed southern extent for Trichostoma simulatum, the Siskiyou blue curls. Um, this is related to vinegar weed, if you guys are familiar with that plant. Um, the dots in this map that are more south than Nevada County are from checklists. So maybe it's there, maybe it isn't. Um, but there's no voucher or even a photo from those places, so there's no way to know for sure. And the same deal with that dot from Truckee. That just seems odd, but we, we just don't know. There's no proof. Um, it, it was nice to be able to confirm that it does, in fact, at least Nevada County, though, with this collection. Uh, next is Adiantum capillus veneris, the black maidenhair firm. Um, this one looks very similar to the California maidenhair firm, um, Adiantum jordanii, which is very common but Adiantum jordanii dies back completely in the summer and uh, and emerges in the winter and then um, 
So it's basically summer deciduous. And this species, black maidenhair fern, is um, green year round. And so you can see in the photo on the right, in these hanging gardens here where I found it, all of the brown shriveled up leaves from years past. Um, so I was really thrilled to be able to add this to the county flora because it has a, while it has a pretty widespread distribution, um, you know, it had never been found here before. And not only that, but I got to visit this first location where I did find it. Um, this stunningly gorgeous grotto, which is exists in the eroded lava cap cliffs, which are full of plant fossils from the Eocene, um, when California was a veritable rainforest. So fossils have been found here of ancient magnolias, avocados, extinct species of maples and oaks and sycamores. Um, I've barely explored this area due to the difficulty in securing permission to visit it, but I know there are more plants worthy, worthy of documenting here. And what's concerning is that this treasure trove of both living and fossilized plants is private and is currently for sale. And so one can only hope that whoever buys it recognizes the extreme rarity of a place like this and preserves it. If there are any moneyed people in the audience, please, please buy this place. I'll tell you where it is if you contact me. Um, next is a species of lupin, which grows on our low elevation lava caps. Uh, there it grows with lupinus bicolor and lupinus nanus, but it is obviously different from those species. It keys to lupinus consinus, which is the distribution map that we're looking at here. Um, but I am absolutely convinced that it is distinct. There is another name we can apply to it. We can call it Lupinus congonii, and that was described from identical plants on lava caps in Tuolumne County. The Jepson maple currently lists congonii as a synonym of Lupinus bicolor, but the spiral flowers of the plant in hand point to that being an error. More study of these lava cap endemics is surely needed, and maybe congonii needs to be resurrected, and we need to start calling uh, these plants by that name. Or maybe it is consignus, despite being disjunct and it's and having an affinity for a unique substrate in that disjunction. If it is in fact consignus, only a single collection from the Butte to Tahoma County border is more northerly. Uh, that collection, by the way, is also on a lava cap. Okay. Uh, next is a shrub I found in the Truckee River Canyon near the eastern county border. It surprised me because it looked like Cenothus cuneatus, the buckbrush, but there's no buckbrush around for a good long while. So I snapped some photos and I moved on. Um, those photos I later sent to Cenothus maverick Jeff Bisbee, who has given a talk to this chapter in the past. Um, and he informed me that I had just found the first ever collection of Cenothus bakeri in all of California. Uh, the type specimen for this species was collected near Carson City in the late 1800s. And then it was not found again until Jeff himself found a population on the Nevada side of Lake Tahoe only 10 years ago. This collection here, um, again, only the third ever, um, is the first time in California. It's very exciting. I'm preparing a notable collection publication uh, for this state record to submit it to Madronio, our most renowned scientific journal for California Bani. So the ruling theory, which this collection lends some credence to, is that this is a hybrid of Cenothus cuneatus and Cenothus prostratus from a time when both were present near the California-Nevada border. Cenothus cuneatus has since been extirpated from the general region, but this hybrid had adaptations to help it hang on. Interestingly, there is another named hybrid with the same two parents, which is called Cenothus flexilis, but those plants would have arisen from a different hybrid event and as a different form in ecology. So I'm not sure how the taxonomic rules demand something like this be addressed, but I'm excited to have added this desert-dwelling Ceanothus to the California flora with this find. And the last plant is one I don't have a name for, um, and that's because it's new to science. This is a Navaricia I found on Gabbro a few years back, and I brought it to the attention of Lee Johnson and David Gowen, who have been revamping Navaricia in some profound ways during the last decade. And there have been genetic tests, and to cut to the chase, we have a new species on our hands. Uh, the paper is being written as I speak. It's in the Navarisha Devaricata group, and it's most similar to Navarisha toriella, except the flowers are much larger, the corolla, corolla lobes are purple, not white, and the style is far exerted, not included. Lee and David have a theory, which is currently being tested in greenhouse experiments, that this species may be self-pollinating, which would be a first in Navarisha. 
It's only been found in a single population, numbering maybe 200 plants or so, but I hope to find more populations in the coming years. I'm actually hoping to organize a rare plant treasure hunt with the red buds this year and maybe for a few more years after. Um, it's difficult to traverse the habitat it prefers, and I only hope that it's not limited to this one very threatened population. It will almost certainly deserve a rare plant ranking one way or the other. And I'd love to go on and on about this species discovery of mine, but we have got to move on and we need to talk about what's next with the flora. Well, first of all, I've got to finish the flora. Um, I have the remaining reports to confirm, a few remaining plants to collect. I'm about three quarters of the way done with porting all of this information from spreadsheets and databases into a form which could be published. And then I have to decide how to publish this thing. Should I do a website with where I can include many more photos, many times more information, and I can keep it up to date as you know we make changes every single year, it seems. Um, but if I were to have a website that would need ongoing funding, I'd probably find myself fundraising more than botanizing, and that doesn't sound very fun. But maybe I should look to print a book. After all, that's the tradition, and there's a chance I can make back even maybe a small portion of the funds I've invested into this. And I can't say it wouldn't be nice to be a published author. Have for me. Thanks, Shay. Okay, so anybody who has any questions uh, can put them in the chat. Um, here is a really lovely question. Um, how can we help? Well, um, document plants. Go out into the woods. Go to places. Well, I mean, okay. Let me back up for a second. One of the most difficult things that has limited my ability to document the plants in the county has been access. Um, I'm not much of a trespasser, and much of our lands are privately owned, and there's just no way to get on them and know what plants are there. Now, I'm not saying you have to call me up and invite me onto your property and have me point out the plants, but you can use that app, iNaturalist, and you can take pictures of all the plants and post them on there. And I guarantee you, if you're posting them within a hundred mile radius of Nevada County, I'm going to see that plant. And um, and then if you got something cool, I'll contact you and we'll go we'll go collect it. And any I'll do you one better. I'll even write your name as an associate collector on the sheet, so your 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 name will go down in botanical history in the herb area. That's the best thing, I think. Just document document plants. Um, and you don't that need any great. anything but a cell yeah. phone to do it. That sounds great. And for those of you who are uh, relatively new to iNaturalist, uh, Shane has given a talk on how to use iNaturalist. And is that up uh, as a YouTube on our YouTube channel? Do you remember? I think it's on the YouTube channel. Pretty sure. If it's not, if it's not, uh, ping us and I'll we'll do another one. find you some some other um, some other way to learn more about iNaturalist because it is absolutely fabulous. Yeah, it, it really so, is just a practice makes perfect thing. Um, you know, you'll post something on there that's unidentifiable and folks will comment on it. Hey, that's unidentifiable. And here's what you do next time to make it identifiable. And then um, you learn that way. Um, so yeah, just roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. I mean, that's the best way to, to find out. Again, everyone's really nice on there. There's there's no sh shaming or anything like that for just posting something. Just make sure, try to get a, a, a picture that's in focus. That's the first step that you can go into it with. And then I believe the second step is uh, to show not only the flower, but also the leaves. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Take as many photos of as many parts of the plant from different angles as you can. You can upload up to 20 photos. And um, I recommend... Of a specific plant, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I recommend taking as many as possible. I mean, some of my observations max out the 20 um, photo limit. Just because, I mean, these are things like that require so many little tiny details and you want to include things like the habitat you found it in and the plant from afar and close-ups and side shots and leaves and flowers and under the flower under the leaves maybe the roots even i mean as many plant parts as you can get in there it's only going to make it easier to identify what you're putting on there we have someone here uh chelsea who really likes your presentation that says i located early coral root orchid in El Dorado County last year and have since been trying to confirm old records. Have you seen Coralariza trifida 
in Nevada County or elsewhere in California? I know there was a record in Nevada County, but not sure if it's been confirmed. Yes. Um, so I have seen Corollariza trifida in Plumas County, but I have not seen it in Nevada County. I know exactly the record you're talking about. Um, it is a misidentification of the yellow form of the spotted coral root, Cor Corollariza maculata. So there is a color form of the very common red orchid with the spotted lower lip um, that I'm that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with if you get out in the conifer forests. Um, there's a color form of that, which is entirely yellow, and it lacks the spots on the lip. So it's very easy to mistake for uh, Corollariza trifida, which has that exact coloration. Um, the difference is the number of veins in the upper sepal, um, which actually makes it quite easy uh, to tell the two apart. And sure enough, uh, whoever collected that record in Nevada County made that easy to make error. And uh, I did examine that record and confirmed it was the yellow form of maculata and not trifida. But cool, cool that you found it in El Dorado County. It, I feel like that's one of those species that could show up in Nevada County at any moment, in, especially in one of those undocumented portions of the county. Uh, and it's just waiting for someone to find it, to be there at the right time and find it and know what they're looking at. Um, it's smaller than most of the other coral rises and could potentially grow in difficult to, to access conifer thick understories. Uh, it doesn't need any light to survive. And so it, I wouldn't be surprised if it were found in Nevada County, but at this point it hasn't yet. So Liz has a very different kind of question. And that is, do you worry about mountain lions? <laughs> well, it's funny you say that. Um, considering that uh, just about two months ago, I had my first ever encounter with a mountain lion uh, in the field. Um, I made it maybe 15, 20 feet from it, and it just growled at me and uh, didn't decided to spare my life that day, basically. Uh, so yes, I mean, when, whenever you're out in the, the woods, uh, there's a number of dangers that you can face, mountain lions being one of them. And, you know, I think that what they say is true, that you, each one of us has probably had several mountain lion encounters, but only the mountain lion was aware of it. And it's just that one time that I became aware of it, it kind of uh, gave me a little fright. That's for sure. <laughs> I was very, very lucky. Um, I don't do anything special to prepare because, like I said, it's kind of in the mountain lion's hands. It's their decision whether they attack you. There's nothing you can really do to stop it. <laughs> It's just one of the risks. Just one of the risks. So uh, Rob asks, how much osaberry have you seen in Nevada County? We have at least 10 plants just downhill from Nevada City here along a hand fine riparian corridor near Woolman. Yeah, um, oso, osaberry is a locally rare plant. So um, one of the aspects of my flora, which I didn't include in this talk only because I haven't yet fully uh, quantif like analyzed my data to be able to pull these out, um, is producing a list of locally rare plants. And so these are plants which are not given any state protections or federal protections or CMPS protections for that matter, but they ought to have some sort of protection. And so the idea is with a list in hand, we can go lobby the county to, um, to adopt this locally rare plants list. And then the county would require surveys for the plants on this list, much like any existing rare plant list. Um, Ventura County in Southern California does have such a program, so it's not unheard of at the county level in California. And the only thing that stops it from being adopted is you have to have a flora for that county first before you can have a locally rare plants list. And so recognizing the value of a locally rare plants list for Nevada County, um, that's one of the things I've sort of coupled into working on this flora so that we can have that, hopefully, if our supervisors agree to it. And uh, But uh, anyway, back to what Rob actually asked about osoberry. It is one of these locally rare plants. I only know of three populations in the county. And uh, it's very common on the coast and especially up in the Pacific Northwest. Like it's not a rare plant across its range, but it's pretty rare in our area. And uh, the concerning thing is that these plants are dioecious. So they're either, each individual is either male or female. 
And so in order for fruit and seeds to be formed, you need both male and female close enough in proximity to have pollinators, you know, bring the pollen over and pollinate the thing. Um, and with only three populations, um, I don't know if that's happening. And frankly, they could all be males or they could all be females and then they're not going to make fruit. And so likely the story with that plant is it's a, um, it's a relic of a time when the Sierras and the coast ranges were right next to each other and before the valley opened up. And the plants that exist here are just still hanging on um, from, from those days. And so they're kind of on their way out, but we get this little like snapshot in time where we get to see them here and enjoy them. Great. Um, one of the things that people want to know is um, when you talk about the the vouchers, some of us are not quite sure what that means. Yeah. Um, so a voucher is a uh, dried and pressed flat sample of a plant, which is mounted to a sheet of paper. And it contains a little note card with all of the information, where you found it, when you found it, the habitat, um, any other um, you know, associated species, the name of the collector, um, all of these things. And those are then uh, deposited in herbaria, which keep all of them in, um, in climate controlled cabinets, essentially. And if you keep them in these climate controlled conditions, a uh, dried and pressed plant can last for hundreds of years. Um, I can look at plants that were collected in the 1700s and it looks like the same as if you dried it uh, the day before, you know. Uh, but if you allow the climate to get, you know, if you allow them to get too warm or too wet uh, or insects get into the herbarium or something like that, they can they can be degraded still. So um, so a voucher is just that one unit of, of a, it's, that's in an herbarium and it's essentially how we conduct peer reviewable plant science. So there's a, there's a saying that's tossed around a lot that a, a plant without a voucher is just a rumor. And so you could tell me, Oh, I saw this plant on my property and I could say, Oh, fantastic. But until you, but if, if you're mistaken, I have no way to know. And so when, when we're doing field work in the botanical sciences, you can make all the claims you want but if you can't sh have a plant that someone else can look at at a later date and say, yup, he was right, or nope, he was wrong. That's like when I was talking about correcting the errors. There are all these errors uh, in the data sets. People collected the plant, they misidentified it. And, uh, but I would not even be able to correct that if they hadn't made the collection. So voucher and collection is just interchangeable words. It's a, a sheet and okay. an herbarium. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so when are, and so at the end of this, you'll, do you want to put the URL for the draft field edition in the chat now? So people have yeah. a chance to capture that. Sorry, I should have done that earlier. Absolutely. I will do that. And we'll put that, uh, as an addendum, as an addition to the description of this program in uh, on the Red website so that there'll be um, a written way to get that uh, that URL. Absolutely, we want people to be able to do that for sure. Yeah, um, and I'll do my due diligence and like when the recording is ready, I'll post it in the Red Bud forum and include the link mm -hmm. as well. So if you follow, if you join our forum on Facebook, you'll get it there as well. Perfect, perfect indeed. What? Oh, there it is. Okay, terrific. So what do you, could you talk just a little bit, somebody asked, about Hell's Half Acre, the, uh, its geology and, and its traditional um, botanic diversity? Yeah. Um, so Hell's Half Acre, like I said, is a lava cap. So lava caps formed um, millions of years ago when the Sierra was more active, was more volcanically active in this region, you would have these eruption events, um, which would essentially cause 
massive mud flows and which were mixed with ash and they would run down the ancestral yuba and the ancestral bear rivers and in, into these canyons and they would uh cover up all of the river rock which is what the miners are trying to get out of and hence my theory that um there there used to be more they used to be more extensive but in any case so they, they fill the 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 river canyons with the and it would harden into this like concrete like substance which was more uh, resistant to erosion so when you had a valley over time erosion for took out the um the hills surrounding it and became a ridge top and so that's why you find lava caps on ridges and hell's half acre is no exception to that um it's a it's a ridge top now where the ancient like I, I assume the ancient yuba once ran and because of the harsh chemistry and the harsh um like physical properties of the soil uh you have specially adapted plants that can only grow on the lava caps um or or in thin soils in general and if you notice if you drive past hell's half acre um you look out into those wildflower fields and you don't see you see um scotch broom on the roadside or you see yellow star thistle on the roadside but you don't see any in the lava cap and that's because even our most uh horrible invasive species can't survive on the lava caps and so what it is is it's a snapshot of what california looked like before all of these non-native european species got here um at least in a special habitat just because they can never they can't get on there one exception being the fillery the erodium species those definitely get on the lava caps and they're a problem um but most of our invasives don't even go on there and that's why they are so renowned because they're mostly native And having a habitat that's mostly native below like 3,000 feet is almost unheard of in this day and age. Wow. Well, there's a, a little question here. Was uh, was CNFS X Baker I named for Milo Baker? Um, I assume so. Uh, I don't really know the history of the naming, but if if there's a plant named Baker I, it's probably named for Milo Baker. Yeah, I recognize some of the names. Oh, yeah, I I, I know some plants that, that were named for that botanist. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. great. So here's the saddle. I know it's hard to estimate sometimes, but when do you think would be a good time to see the Hell's Half Acre plants? And the answer is a year and a half ago. Oh, well, you can still go to the Wildflower Ridge Trails, the Bear Yuba Land Trust Preserve. Um or you can drive by some of the other existing parcels, but yeah, I don't, I don't even want to get started on that topic. Um, to answer your question, yeah. it depends on what you want to go see. Um, things are blooming there now and will continue to bloom through the end of June. Um, I would say peak bloom as far as like when the most amount of species are at their highest uh, level of beauty is probably early May. Um, but yeah, it's you, it's around early May and, you know, I don't know if we have a couple more snowstorms, it could get pushed back. And if it stops precipitating and warms up significantly, it could be pushed up. Um, but yeah, check the weather and shoot for that early May and adjust accordingly. Great. Yeah. And for those of you who are like, well, what is he talking about? You know, like the, the sadness of health has like Look on our Red Bud website under conservation, and there's a whole a whole explanation of what has happened with Hell's Half Acre, which is not the subject for this evening. Today is a much happier day. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the local I don't want I want to get down to like if there are any other little questions, um, be sure to put them in. Uh, but one question is about localized key. Could you talk about a little bit more? about a localized key and it sounds like something that would be very helpful in local um conservation advocacy um efforts and how how could people who are who want to be involved in this at the at the county for in this county how could they access a list like that What's the um, i'm assuming you're talking about the locally rare plant yes list. yes Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It would be beneficial. I mean, that's my main goal in even releasing it. Um, you can't conserve plants of a region if you don't know what plants exist there. 
And before you have a flora, you don't, you don't know what plants exist there, really. I mean, you, you have a, a incomplete picture anyway. And so you don't know what is, as far as like, if we all have limited time and energy and money towards conserving plants, where do we focus on? And um, a flora lays those things out for you. And then a, a locally rare list goes a step beyond that to just compile all of those things. Um, I'm, I'm going to have it out. It'll be ready around the same time the flora is ready. Um, and I will publicize it widely, be mostly because I'm going to be like trying to rally folks to push the county to adopt it. Um, I think it's really important. Um, now, people who want to develop this county or do major works in the county are not going to like it. So I think we're going to have some stiff opposition at the same time. But I think there's a way to... Uh, there's a way to make that argument that will make everyone happy. Um, so to be included on the locally rare list, you have to have fewer than five populations in the county, which uh, is not very many at all. So if you have six populations in the county, that wouldn't even go on the list. Um, and when you think of like um, like Chrissy's image here of the Calicordis, um, there's probably what hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of populations of that plant. It's not threatened by any means. So it wouldn't go on the list. It's only those that, um, you know, a couple hundred plants at, at, at most out of the 1600. Um, but it's important to save them because they might be on the edge of their, uh, their range. And so if by not protecting them, like let's say it's the northernmost extent of something by not protecting it in Nevada County, now you've just shortened its range significantly. If you take it out of the middle of its range and remove that plant, it can repopulate itself. Um, but from the edges is where it really starts to contract. And uh, you know, if you want to get involved, again, it's just document things. Um, I think that that's probably the best thing that can be done because if you, if I'm out there thinking there's only one population of this plant, but you have the second, third, fourth, and fifth, sixth population on your property or at your friend's property or on the trail you go on that I just have not seen it on. Um, it can only improve that list. You know, the last thing we want to do is undermine the message by including things on the locally rare plant list, which are not actually that rare. And it's almost impossible to be everywhere and have seen everything in, on a county level to know how act how truly accurate um that that kind of list would be rob asks a question that's really related to that and that is about the california department of fish and wildlife and um the and whether or not they would list the mcnab cypress as 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 protected because they're not you said due to lack of it being on their radar, do you have anything to say about the McNabb Cypress and its status? Yeah, actually, if you can see behind me right here, there's a little piece, that thing that looks like mistletoe hanging over me. That's a piece of McNabb Cypress I have drying for a collection. So um, I was just in the McNabs the other day. Anyway, um, the, uh, the McNabb Cypress, you know, I think it's on their radar. I just don't think it's particularly rare from where CDFW is coming from. Like if you go to the coast ranges there, there's tons of it, a very extensive. Uh, it's a, it's an entire ecosystem unto itself. In our area, we have like three groves left. Um, so it, and it is constantly being cut back, um, at the corner of Brunswick and Idaho, Maryland, over by uh, Sutton, that development cut down a whole bunch of them. The Dorsey Marketplace is cutting down a whole bunch of them. They were not protected during the Ponderosa West Fire Project. They're just not seen as valuable in this county, let alone CDFW on the county level. And so they're just disappearing constantly. And the idea, and I think what Rob is pointing at, is like, we need to take steps now so that we protect them before they become dire, like before the situation becomes dire and they become super rare. And McNabb Cypress is one of those which could see that because people don't value the habitat that it grows on. They see it as uh, it's not 200 foot ponderosa pines. It's easy to cut down and develop. Um, but 
as far as what CDFW, I mean, just CDFW's goals and their purpose is not going to consider it's only going to consider stuff on the state level. It's not going to consider things that see that are rare here, but not necessarily rare in California. And that's where these locally rare lists come from. Uh, it's, it's meant to patch that hole in the system. So I wanted to ask a question that kind of gets to this locally rare list, this locally rare plant list. And that is um, I live in, and I'm sure other people do too, I live in an area uh, where the shaded fuel breaks for the wild flower, wild, pardon me, the woodpecker ravine um, uh, uh, wildfire mitigation project is going to take place. Well, they'll be doing shaded fuel breaks. And as we know from some other shaded fuel breaks that have been done in this county and adjoining counties, sometimes the plants that have high habitat value or high botanical value are preserved and sometimes they are not. And question is, what can we do as a chapter, as individuals, as people live in the community, any of those to get a list of locally rare plants in front of the uh, the environmental consultants who are going to do the environmental analysis uh, in advance of the shaded fuel breaks. Yeah, I'm, I mean, unfortunately, that's kind of a, a a bad project for this because, like, that's going to happen before there's any chance. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I want to do this is uh, it's happened so frequently that there hasn't been a list like this and people have just done the work. And so like, it's hard to go back and say, well, if we would have had the locally rare list at that time, we would have done things differently. It's just meant to protect things in the future. The Woodpecker Ravine project, um, there was actually an open house about it last night. Um, yeah, I, I went, had yeah. wanted to go and, you know, I was my plan, I, but I, I wasn't able to, um, and my plan was what I would recommend is just sort of be a thorn in their side and like demand accountability and demand that they do good work, you know, make sure they know about the cedar crest popcorn flower and make sure that the people who are going to be doing the surveys for that plant, which I doubt, I, I mean, I definitely think they're going to do surveys for that plant, know how to identify it. Uh, it's a very tricky to identify plant, which hasn't been seen in 80 years and most consultants I've noticed from reading a lot of CEQA reports in the area don't even look for it and they the reason they give for why they're not going to look for it is because it hasn't been seen in 80 years which makes zero sense because in the course of this flora I'm finding plants that haven't been seen in 100 years and I'm finding them again because they're still here it's just nobody's looking in this area so we really need we one of the reason one of the ways that Nevada County is at a disadvantage when you compare it to El Dorado County the entirety of the coast and Chico is because those areas have really strong botany contingents who are working constantly on improving uh, their botanical understanding of their area. And Nevada County doesn't have a lot of that. You know, it's a small group of folks and we really do need some, as many people as possible, like just, uh, you know, increasing their own understanding and doing this this sort of outreach so that when there are projects like that, uh, like the Woodpecker Ravine, that we can be noisy about it. And we could sort of like let them know, like, we are going to check your work. <laughs> and we are, we are going to look at the CEQA that you put out, or you, we're going to look at your species lists and and criticize it. And, uh, and hopefully just from them being aware that there are people who care for the plants in an area, they'll hold themselves to a higher standard. Um, I think we saw that with the whole Hell's Half Acre thing, where I think, you know, pg &E thought that it didn't matter to the community that they could put in that facility. And they were shocked when there was the huge public outcry after they destroyed that, that portion of it. And, uh, you know, that made me on some level feel hopeful that there is a contingent of the local community who does care about the environment here and will stand up for it. And, uh, and yeah, it, we're going to be forevermore bombarded with additional projects like 
uh, development mm -hmm. fire breaks that we just need to hold people to the task. Sounds great. I'll, I'll circle back with you on that. Um, one, one last question here. Uh, this is from uh, Nancy, our, who has been uh, one of the horticultural leads in Redbud. Has there been any clarification on the Nevada County flannel bush as far as is it, is it, you know, is it related to decumbens or what do you know? Um, well, you know, all, all I know is very preliminary stuff at this point. Um, the study is not complete at this at this juncture. Um, I'm sure we will hear something soon. The 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 short story of it is it's likely that our plants in Nevada and Yuba counties are not decumbents. But it's looking like the studies are going to be inconclusive as far as what is what is this entity, um, which is, you know, don't get me wrong. That's a good thing for people who are concerned with conserving decumbents, um, because it means that, for instance, plants from Nevada and Yuba counties would not be used as restoration sources for the decumbents populations in El Dorado County. Um, but it's still disappointing because we still don't know what these things are <laughs> in our county. Um, to me, it seems like they're not, they're from looking at preliminary data, of course. So, you know, I might be eating these words later um, once the final data comes out. But uh, but it seems like we probably have a unique, like a distinct species, but it might be so subjective that it really depends on whoever writes the paper, what we ultimately fall on and it could be heartbreaking um if that's if they choose to go with the insignificant route it happens all the time in taxonomy uh and this is the the big arguments that people have um it's the no i want to call it dodecathion no it's a primula by genetics but i like the name dodecathion and it's you know it's these are the kind of arguments that all the botanists and people who care about plants have constantly um Anyway, to answer Nancy's question, we probably won't know even after this latest study is done. Thank you, Shane. Hey, Shane, <laughs> would you mind putting up again for people for just for the next couple of minutes as we say goodbye, um, your contact information, just to make yeah, sure yeah. people can see it. So thank you everybody for coming and thank you so much, Shane. It's absolutely been uh, fascinating. I'm sure everybody has learned a tremendous amount. And uh, as soon as we can, we will have this up on our Red Bud YouTube channel. So you can look at it again and you can tell your friends. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. We'll leave up the slide for another couple of minutes, but feel free to leave and you won't have missed a thing. Bye-bye, all. <laughs>